Good afternoon, my name is Mizuki Kadawaki, and over the summer, I work in the Mobus class in the plant biology department under, under the membership of Rujuan Lee. And my project was to analyze the data of the RNA sequencing of two different F1 generations of Brassica nepus. <coughs> Brassica nepus is more commonly known as canola, and it looks something like this. And it is a tetrapoid, meaning that there are four, four full sets of chromosomes. This is because Brassica nepus was a cross between Brassica osiria and Brassica rapa, which are both diploids, and they have two full sets of chromosomes. Now, because Brassica nepus is a crop, it is especially important for it to have favorable <coughs> traits for higher yields to make profit. And this is why our collaborators in Korea created two different <coughs> synthetic Brassica nepus plants. One is called Da A, and the other is called Da O. Da A was an artificial cross between Brassica osiria and Brassica rapa, while Da O was an artificial cross between Brassica nepus and Brassica ginsea. And Da A and Da O have, were shown to have different gene expressions in oil content and in drought tolerance, which is why they were used in the study to create the F1 generations that I studied. Now to create the two F1 generations that I studied, there were crosses made between the two plants, Da A and Da O. In one of the F1 generations, 414, it was a cross between a male Da A plant and a female Da O plant, while the other, 415, was a cross between a male Da O plant and a female Da A plant. Now, these two F1 generations uh, have the same exact parents, and so they should have the same genotype. However, they are shown to have different drought tolerances, meaning that they show different phenotypes. So even though they have the same genotype, they show different phenotypes. And the only reason how this could happen is from different gene expression. So in order to study gene expression, RNA sequencing was conducted on the two F1 generations. RNA sequencing is a method to examine gene expression, and it is when a long piece of mRNA is fragmented into short leads. Now these small fragments are then mapped back to the original genome, so back to the DNA. And what's significant about this is that from this information, you can tell which genes are more highly expressed than others. So for example, you can tell from the blue gene on the far right, you can tell that this gene is more highly expressed because there are seven, read, seven RNA fragments mapped back to it than this middle gene, which only has five genes mapped back to it. And with this information, you can do gene function analysis uh, to find out more. For the F1 gener for the RNA sequencing for my experiment, there the lab conducted RNA sequencing on the two F1 generations. But from each F1 generation, there were four different tissue types used. Now these four different tissue types were from four different developmental stages of the plant, and this is important because gene uh, gene expression is dependent on different tissue types as well as different developmental stages from the plant. So genes expressed in a young plant may not necessarily be expressed in a flowering plant. And to get a full set of signals, it's very important to have sequencing data from many different tissue types and developmental stages. So the developmental stages that were used were young, which is when the plant is first starting to come out of the ground, uh, flowering, which is pretty self-explanatory, and early and late silique. And now silique is a scientific term for the fruit of the plant. So an earlier and a later stage of that. Now on top of this, there were three biological replicates done for all of all four uh, tissue types in both F1 generations. And this is for statistical power, and so we could have more confidence in our analysis later on. Now my first step to, was to map out the number of differentially expressed genes between the two F1 generations, and these were my results. Uh, the four subplots from left to right are of young, flowering, early silique, and late silique. And the red bars are of F1414, and the blue bars are of F1415. And the y-axis is the number of differentially expressed genes. So the higher the bars, the more differentially expressed genes there are. Now at a glance, you can tell that there are the most differentially expressed genes in the young tissue type, which is why I decided to focus my analysis on the young tissue. And our collaborators uh, confirmed that many of these differentially expressed genes are drought tolerance related. 
And now we come back to the question why there are differential express genes in the first place. Because, as you were, if you recall, there are these two F1 generations <coughs> come from the same parent. The only difference is the paternal and maternal switch. This brings me to my hypothesis that gene imprinting is the reason behind the differentially expressed genes. Uh, gene imprinting happens when genes have more than one copy of every gene. And because Brassica napis is a tetraploid, it has more than one copy of each gene. And when one is constantly expressed higher than the other, then this could lead to differentially expressed genes. So for example, if in this gene marked by the box, if the paternal gene is always expressed higher than the maternal, then in 414, the, the gene more highly expressed would be dot A's gene, while in 415, the gene more highly expressed would be dot O. And, this, and because dot A and dot O uh, have, uh, differentially are differentially expressed, then there would be differentially expressed genes in 414 and 415. Now in order to answer my question, I used the computational and statistical language R. And my first step was to filter the RNA sequencing data of 414 and 415 based on the depth. Now depth is the number of times that a number of RNA fragments that map back to an original genome at a specific place. So I only use considered data with, I only consider genes with uh, more than 10 reads mapped back to it at a specific place. And also genes with low expression values and low quality were not considered either. From this information, I got the differentially expressed genes inherited from the parents in the f -lands. My first step uh, in analysis was to map out the genotypes of the F1 generations. Now because I am working with the F1 generation, I would expect that most of them to be heterozygous, and most sites were heterozygous as expected. As you can see, the left plot is F1414, the right plot is F1415, and the, hetero the red bar is heterozygous, and the blue bar is homozygous. And so yes, most of the most of the sites are heterozygous, but in both F1 generations, there are homozygous uh, sites as well. And this actually isn't uncommon either because we are dealing with RNA data. Now if this was DNA, you would expect all of them to be heterozygous, but because of uh, changes in transcription, uh, sometimes the RNA may appear to be homozygous even though their packet is actually heterozygous. But this still doesn't really answer my question whether the imbalance in the maternal versus paternal gene expression is the reason why there are differentially expressed genes between the two F1 generations. And this is why I conducted an allele ratio test and calculated the reference ratios for every single uh, site. And these were my results. The left subplot is 414 and the right subplot is 415 in blue. And the x-axis shows the reference ratio and the y-axis is the count for the frequency. Now in the reference ratio shows the amount of expression, the ratio of expression between the maternal and the paternal, and which one is favored more. So if the reference ratio is at 0.5 right in the center, it means that the maternal gene and the paternal gene are both equally expressed, so it's 50-50. But if it diverges from the center, it means that either one is expressed more than more highly than the other. And anything diverging, or anything on the tail ends or on the outsides of the black lines shown are where the, the reference ratio is diverged enough from 0.5 to where it was considered significant. Now this supports my hypothesis that um, genes are expressed to more in maternal or paternal copies, but it is not enough to confirm it. Uh, there are many feature implications for my, uh, there are many uh, feature research uh, ways to use my analysis. Uh, it can be, a statistical modeling can be done on my analysis to understand inheritance better, and also it can be used for breeding, uh, more specifically in agriculture. Uh, with climate change, it has been more and more important for crops and for plants in general to have higher drought tolerance. And in this specific case, one of the F1 generations must be uh, selected to create subsequent generations starting with the F2. Uh, thank you to the following people for helping me throughout uh, the, my summer. Uh, first, Yu Zhongli, 
uh, my research mentor, uh, Dr. Julian Malouf, my professor, uh, Sarah Hind, my counselor, and to Dr. Pomeroy for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Genotype quality is the confidence interval <coughs> that the genotype shown at that specific data site is correct. So I think I used uh, anything below mapping quality of 40 was not considered, and anything below genotype quality of 30 was not considered. George. Uh, what is significant about the genotype? Uh, so, uh, dot A and dot O. Uh, Brassicanibus is. Um, used to create canola oil, and canola oil is high in uh, eucearic acid and oleic acid, and so dot A is high in eucearic acid, and dot O is high in oleic acid, and by uh, re by crossing the two, uh, the two were crossed in hopes that they could create a good balance for the canola oil. Could your analysis be done on different tissue types? Uh, yeah, so I uh, I focus my analysis on the young tissue type, but by just running my algorithms with the other other new tissue types, it can easily be done. Good afternoon, my name is Andrew Chen, and for the last past six weeks, I've been working in the lab of Dr. Sweet Bay in the Department of Anatomy, Physiology, and Cell Biology under the direct mentorship of Melissa Polotalo and Rita Baum. Har harmful algal blooms are when algal populations proliferate due to excess nutrients 
mainly nitrogen and phosphorus, which are the limiting nutrients, and also increased surface water temperatures, which are directly correlated with climate change. These harmful algal blooms can have negative effects on the environment, such as by compromising the water quality with chemicals such as cyanotoxins. When animals drink the water and ingest the cyanotoxins, they can become very sick and even die. Algal blooms also create hypoxic environments, so that's when the oxygen concentration in the water is so low that animals such as fish that live in the water die because of suffocation. So the organism that I focused on was Microcystis aeruginosa, and Microcystis is a uni unicellular colonial freshwater cyanobacteria that is very common. Toxic strains of Microcystis produce Microcystin, which are cyclic hepatotoxins. Hepatotoxins are liver, to liver toxins, and they can cause liver failure, vomiting, diarrhea, and even death. Generally, Microcystins are released during cell lysis, so it's not until the later stages of algal blooms when microcystins are released into the surrounding waters because that's when algal, algal populations start to die. My research question was, how do chemicals affect the growth rates of microcystins? I chose this question because in the Tay Lab, there haven't been many exposures, exposure experiments done on microcystins, and also I wanted to see uh, what anthropogenic chemicals would have an effect on microcystins. So I chose glyphosate, diuron, plastic, and BPA. I chose glyphosate and diuron because they are both herbicides that are commonly used in agriculture. And when there are periods of increased rainfall, uh, these chemicals can be swept into nearby water bodies and contaminate them. I also wanted to focus on common pollutants in aquatic environments, such as plastic. And I also chose BPA because BPAs are uh, very related to plastic, and there has been concerns of BPA leaching into drinking water in the past. So my hypothesis was that adding chemicals will inhibit the growth of microcystis. To start off, we have to prepare our solutions in order to treat our microcystis. So for all the chemicals except for plastics, we already had that in the lab, but all we had to do was add our correct, con our correct uh, weights to cyanobacteria media. But for the plastic, what we did is we actually went downstairs to a vending machine and we bought a plastic bottle. So, so we sat at our lab counter and then we cut half of the bottle up into tiny little pieces. Then we heated the plastic pieces in deionized water at 100 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes. After we did that, we added uh, this plastic solution to 2x cyanobacteria media so then we can have our final uh, plastic solution. So here are the concentrations that I used in my experiment. The high concentrations were determined from LC50 values that I found in literature for microcystis. And if I couldn't find it for microcystis, I found it for other related organisms such as other algae. And for the low concentrations, I found these in the literature as well. And then these are generally the concentrations that are found in the environment. So first, I started my exposure in the 96 well plate. So what I did is I, I completely randomized the treatments in the 96 well plate, and I ran them all in triplet kit. I also included positive and negative controls. After three days, we saw what different chemicals had an effect on the growth of the microcystis, and based on that, we chose specific chemicals for exposure in 250 mil flask. Uh, for the flask, we also included another plastic solution, except this time we heated the plastic for five hours instead of 15 minutes because we wanted to see the effects of how heating it for a longer period of time would leach it, leach more chemicals into the water and how that would affect the cyanobacteria. So this is our setup for incubation. So on the left, right here, that is our 96 well plate. And then this little setup was to help avoid evaporation in the wells so we'd actually have some volume to measure with our spectrophotometer. On the right, this is our setup for the flask. Uh, so we actually measured varying degrees of light intensity for each square in the grid. So then every day after we took our flask out to take a sample and measure them, when we put that back in, we randomized, so then we would minimize the effects of the varying light intensity. So the spectra, we use a spectrophotometer to measure the absorbance of chlorophyll at 684 nanometers. 
and we made a calibration curve with known cell densities of microcystis. We had a very high R square value that was 0.999, and after that, we got our equation, and after that, we used our equation to back calculate the cell density from the absorbance that we got from our reading. So these are the results for our 96 well plate after 12 days. Uh, on the right, as you can see here, this is the back side, or the underside of the 96 well plate, and I zoomed into here, and you can actually see the microcystis forming colonies. I also graphed the growth rates of microcystis with our readings every single day, and I'd like to point out that of the very top, on the positive control and the low concentration for BPA were essentially neck and neck. At the very bottom, diuron seemed to inhibit the growth the most. So looking closer to it, we had an acclimation period of about five to six days, and we also saw this with the flask exposures. Uh, after the acclimation period, that's when we started to see the diuron concentrations start to diverge from the rest of the treatments. And looking at this part of the graph, we can see that obviously the positive control grew the most, along with BPA low, and diuron inhibited the growth the most. And for all of our other treatments, they exhibited varying degrees of inhibition, but they were nearly as effective as diuron. So here is a a bar graph of the ending cell densities for our 96 well plate. And then, yeah, as you can see here, the diuron really had a drastic effect compared to the rest of the treatments. So here are the results for our flask exposures. Uh, we used a positive control, a low concentration for glyphosate, low concentration for BPA, and both of our plastic solutions. So you can tell with your naked eye that the glyphosate and the BPA flask were much greener than the both of the plastic class. And that is also seen in the graph for growth rates. Uh, the positive control was somewhat in between the treatments, and glyphosate and BPA actually seemed to stimulate growth, while plastics uh, inhibited growth similar to the 96 old plate. So for an overview of the results, Diron inhibited growth of microcystis the most, and we kind of expected this because we knew that Diron was an inhibitor of photosystem 2, which is essential for the electron transport chain, but then we didn't expect the, the drastic uh, effects of inhibition. And across the board, we saw that microcystis grew a lot more slowly when it was exposed to plastics, and for BPA and glyphosate, these results were ultimately inconclusive because we had contradictory results for the 96 volt plate and the flasks. BPA and glyphosate both seem to inhibit growth in the wells, but they actually seem to stimulate growth in the flasks. And we don't know if this is due to the scale of the exposure. Also, some further improvements to this, to this experiment in the future would be to replenish chemicals. We only exposed the, um, our microcystis to the chemicals in the very beginning, and we didn't have any secondary exposures. So there's a possibility that the chemicals could have degraded uh, during the acclimation period, and we just didn't get to see those results. Also, as you can see here, uh, the microcystis clumped up into colonies, so then what we could do to ensure the accuracy of the readings is to have multiple absorbance readings, so we can reduce the variability within each reading, and we can actually mix the wells to make it a more even solution before we measure the absorbance. Uh, also, we can test for different endpoints besides growth, such as oxidative stress or health by determining photosynthetic efficiency. So I'd like to thank Dr. Sweet Kay for letting me work in his lab, and I'd like to thank Melissa and Rita uh, for being really awesome grad students and for helping us along the way. I want to give a special shout out to Chelsea, our residential culture expert, uh, because she knows a lot about this and then she helped me set up my experiment, like told me what to do, and then she also let me steal a bunch of her media. Uh, I'd like to thank Shelly for being an awesome lab partner and the rest of the Tay Lab for helping me and making my experience really wonderful. And I'd also like to thank everyone at YSP and my counselor, Steven, for a great experience. Thank you.
Yes. So is boiling a plastic in water, is that a common way to study plastic pollution, or was that a method you guys came up with? Um, it's a method that we came up with because I read an article about how the plastics, uh, PET specifically, would actually leach antimony into the water. Uh, so the, the study, they had multiple um, setups and then they had different temperatures at which it was at which um, the plastic was heated and it showed that um, as the temperature went up it took about a quicker period of time for the plastic to actually leach chemicals in there and then we just chose uh, 100 degrees Celsius so it would go faster. Yes. Uh, in the 96 volt plate, around that 2 minute mark there is a peak observed. Do you know what that signifies exactly? Oh, so this peak, uh, that is for, like I should say, low. Um, so when we measured the observance, we actually, yeah, we actually saw a peak. And initially, we thought that that was due to it carrying it over, carrying capacity and crashing. But looking at the rest of the results, obviously not. So we looked back at our data, and we saw that um, in one of our readings, there was actually a reading that was really high. Um, we think that's a false reading. and. So I just didn't take it out, didn't take that outlier point. Yeah, but it should be mostly black. So there's several slides black. You have to picture like all the different glass slides of the algae in it. Um, no, you went back. Yeah, that one. So a lot. So why are like some of them completely clear and some of them have like a ton of algae? Why isn't there like a medium and some of them have a little bit? Um, because we also included negative controls of all of our. Um, treatments. So we would expect um, at least half of them to be completely clear. And then for the border around here, uh, we we only put blanks of water into there because we didn't want any border effects to interfere with our results. By using the um, vending machine bottle, were you worried about some outside substances that could like inhibit or something that you over? Um, so when we bought it, uh, after that, we, we rinsed it in DI water to try to get out any like contaminants, but then it's actually good that we used an like, example from like from that would be used like commercially because it's like the plastic bottles and all like the the man-made things that get into the water. So this would actually more accurately study what would what what we are putting into the water and not just just the plastic. Uh, 
They find out genotyping the next five thousand or next one thousand um, genes for this project. Now, this is extremely vital for the medical field, as say you have a mutation. Um, a genetic mutation can be replicated in a mouse model, and thus it is easier to find treatments and study a smaller subject. So MVP specializes in producing genetically engineered mice, and these mice are genetically engineered genetically engineered through a process called pronuclear injection. CRISPR-Cas9 regions are injected into a zygote. The zygote is then transferred to a pseudo-pregnant host mouse, which will then give birth to a transgenic mouse with that gene expression. Now, Chelsea mentioned CRISPR modified DNA. CRISPR is cutting-edge technology, especially in the genomic world. It's a Cas9 protein and guide RNA, and CRISPR essentially is a multitude of short, partially palindromic repeats across the genome. So how does CRISPR work? Guide RNA is created and integrated into the cell. Guide RNA is basically RNA that's designed to replicate a certain piece of the DNA sequence. A Cas9 protein is added and the target DNA is cut out by the Cas9 protein. New DNA will then replace old DNA. So, this is an example of the CRISPR-Cas9 system as represented through crispr making. A single guide RNA will come into the cell and bind to the target sequence. The Cas9 protein will then bind onto the single guide RNA. This induces a double strand break. These two pieces are then repaired through one of two methods, non-homologous end joining, which, which is also known as knockout by frame shift, or homologous recombination with donor DNA, which is knock and point mutation or insertion. Now, this is a depiction of different types of knockouts and knockins. So, the gene we worked with here, 29, was a conditional knockin. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is an effective alternative to cloning. It amplifies the DNA to make millions of copies of a um, desired DNA sequence. Each cycle takes approximately a minute, and usually it's used in the early stages of DNA sequencing, screening, and or finding inserts and relations. PCR is good for detecting large changes, because as you can see, this, um, this ladder is a thousand base pairs long, and the larger the insert or knockout is, the easier it is um, and will be to see on the gel. So, for example, Say you were knocking in something with 100 base pairs on a 1,000 base pair band, that's 1 to 10. Now imagine reducing that to 10 base pairs, that's 1 to 100. So the size difference is noticeable in the sense that it will reduce significantly. Now, Pac-Man is the same thing as PCR, but it is in real time. Quantitative PCR is a prediction rather than um, running a gel, um, running DNA on a gel. So TACMAN, you put a 96 wall plate in the machine and it will predict what the final sequence will look like. It's better for detecting small changes as it looks for the cut sites, and you can get these results in approximately two hours. Like I said, it um, screens for the cut sites and it looks for inserts and relations. So this is an example of a amplification curve and it's a logarithmic curve that follows the same set of this PCR with the x-axis being cycle numbers and the y-axis being the number of reactions, or number of reactions, and then the threshold being the change in the cycle. So some factors that we have to consider when handling TACM and PCR are that the process of genetically engineering the mice is expensive and it's a complicated process with many ways where something can go wrong. Pac-Man is initially more expensive than PCR, but however, PCR cannot detect small base pair changes, and Pac-Man can. It has a more sensitive probe. So these factors lead us to the question, is it more efficient to use Pac-Man before traditional PCR over these three methods? Knock-in of LOX-P, a knock-in of SNP, and a knock-in of GFP. So the gene Chelsea and I worked with was year 29, and we inserted two LOX-P sites creating a conditional knock-in of lock speed. We did this by collecting 32 samples from four different um, mice colonies, 
and then inserting the locked P sites, and then using attack man screening followed by PCR to see where we would um, get the positives. So this is an NTI vector file, and here you can see this is the cut site. And then three base pairs ahead is where the cam begins, which is just the guide to find where you cut it. And then you have the guide, and then you have your lock speed inserts. And then it's lock speed insert, guide, cut site, pan. So that's just like a this, this uh, visual representation of what we're talking about. So the results from the GMIR-29 experiment show that there were two samples out of the 32 that we screened that were positive for both lock-ins. And these samples were CR1646-6 and CR1646-9. There were also many exonerated mice found, as can be seen by the PCR. And the two samples were then sent off to be sequenced. So this is the PCR gel for the year 29. So the order we did it in was a little unorthodox, as we did a PCR followed by a TACMAN followed by a PCR. Where realistically, you should do a TACMAN to get your predicted positives, and then run those positives on the PCR gel to confirm. So here, these are our two confirmed positives. As you can see, these, the higher band is the wild type band, which is the control, and the bottom band is the exon deletion, and the wild type band is with the two lock speed inserts. So as can be seen by this quantitative PCR report sheet, there were only two positive, two samples positive for both blocks P sites on both the five prime end and the three prime end, and those would be again samples three CR one six four six six and CR one six four four eight nine. However, you can see three positive samples on the five prime end, three samples that were positive for a blocks P site on the five prime end, and this could be due to possible degradation. So after we confirmed that there were two positive samples. We sent them in to be pcr again, and we cut the top band of those two samples on the PCR gel. The top band is the wild type band with the lock speed inserts, and we sent those off for sequencing. However, when they came back, only one sample was positive for both lock speed sites, as can be seen by the highlighted blue data. And this could possibly be due to the fact that when the other sequence data came back, that showed an exon deletion rather than an insertion. So that would have to be sent for resampling. Another method that we analyzed was a knock-in of SNP, which is a single nucleotide polymorphism. The most ideal screening method would be to use a TACMAN assay before traditional PCR, because since a SNP is only one base pair long, cannot, this small change cannot be seen in a traditional PCR gel, whereas it can be by so we also looked at a not of GRP, and we decided that the ideal method of screening was a PCR. TACMAN is usable, but in terms of cost efficiency, it isn't because it's up to 184 extra dollars for what you can see on a PCR gel because of the large size of the green flush protein. And a thousand base pairs long. That's extremely large, and running a TACMAN just isn't um, a bad idea. So, since MVP is a production company, cost efficiency needs to be taken into consideration as well. In this scenario, we are assuming that there's an average of 20 mice samples used, and this is for a knock-in of SNP. Because it's a knock-in of SNP, a TACMAN needs to be run before doing a PCR. So that results in a total of seven worker hours. Assuming that the average SRA makes $35 an hour, the worker cost will total up to $245. By doing a TACMAN, we can assume that there will be three positive samples, and only those three samples need to be sent to be PCR, which will bring the total experimental cost to $530.25. As for the GFP, there is no need to run a TACMAN assay since GFP is about 1,000 base pairs long and can easily be seen on a PCR gel. PCR is a total of five work hours because amplification takes four hours and purification takes about one hour. So the worker cost comes out to be $175.
the total PCR cost will be $207, and the total experimental cost comes out to be $382. As for the G near 29, experiment with the two locks key inserts. The total was $862.50. This is because we ran an initial PCR that probably should not have been used. Um, so we had a total of 12 work hours due to the addition of the initial PCR, which came out to be $420 just for work hours. We ran a tap in on all 32 samples with a custom probe, and this came out to be $304.40, including the work hours. The second PCR cost us $195.90, um, taking into consideration that we only had two positive samples that we had to send to be so, TACMAN and traditional PCR are essentially complementary. It's situational because running one of these tests usually depends on a lot of factors, one of them being who is running it, so it's up to the individual. Um, a knock in for GFP is efficient with only PCR, especially in the because you get a lot more positives. And a knock-in of SNP would be most efficient with a TACMAN followed by traditional PCR, whereas a knock-in of LOX P would be most efficient with a TACMAN and a PCR as well. So, how does this affect the real world? Better accuracy in genome editing will lead to more mouse models being produced at a faster rate, taking into consideration that MVP is a production company making mouse models for research labs and individuals all around the world. And then these research labs and whoever is ordering these mouse models will have the models for their studies, leading to more um, discoveries and cures being found much faster. In future directions, um, biotechnology companies are a big help in this because they are the ones who are supplying the equipment. Um, currently, Hyogen is one of the leaders of biotechnology equipment and want to know who multiplies PCR kit in the top of the line um, PCR kit, identifying five wells at a time. And MGEL currently uses the Quantex Multiplex PCR kit. So we would like to thank our mentor, Dr. Josh Wood, for giving us this opportunity to shadow in his lab and research. And we would like to thank the entirety of MGEL, Brandon Willis, Russell, Andrew, Han who isn't here, and Jeff who isn't here because they have families. <laughs> 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 and then we'd like to thank all of the um, Lindsay, Carla, um, Dr. Palmore for this great opportunity. Um, so, any questions?
they're the, essentially the same idea, but it's the way you go about it. So attack man is usually two hours versus conservative five hours. And it's all situational, but employee wage is more Like they're getting paid by the hour. So you just want to see where it fits more productively than other times. Any other questions? Raj? I do attack man as assays like isolate like single case. Is it through virus too, like PCR? Yeah. Oh, so TACMAN is basically quantitative PCR. So it's able to like, it's able to screen. Um, so PCR is basically, it only looks at the endpoint result, whereas TACMAN looks at the entire process, which allows it to find the cut sites easily. And you can identify, I guess, faster whether or not you have the right insertion in the right place. Okay. But it's good to follow up with traditional PCR, because since it's since TACMAN is a prediction, it's better to confirm those positives with, by actually taking a gel and then running the DNA across the gel. Any other questions? 